Awesome. Um, so please welcome me in joining our next speakers. We've got Graham Lewis, the Chief Pipeline Officer, and we have John Cosgrove, the Chief Executive Officer at Lightfold. How are you guys going? Um, Lightfold is a specialist analytics consultancy. It's focused on the Salesforce ecosystem. Uh, they've worked with some of the biggest brands around the world, as well as some smaller businesses doing cool things here at home. Um, working closely with product teams, shaping how platforms evolve, and they both keep closely updated with the latest developments. So uh, thank you very much. And as always, if anyone has questions, please throw them in that chat. And if we have time, we'll do a, a short QA after your talk. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Well, um, thanks, guys. Thanks for making the time. Uh, JC, like we said, uh, CEO at Lightfold. We're going to ping pong here and um, throw back and forward in the course of the presentation. Um, uh, and just like Chris said, Lightfold is a, a consultancy that specializes in, um, we love this new phrase, the modern data stack. We didn't invent that. Mm -hmm. That's um, that's something which has emerged globally. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit, if we can, about kind of, you know, why we have focused on that and why that's so important to us. And part of the way to do that is um, we've got a little story that we like to tell about why Lightfold kind of thinks about data a bit differently. Um, so we've been we've been involved in the the world of embedded intelligence and cloud intelligence now for um, about ten years in various incarnations, and um, certainly going through the cloud revolution. I spent quite a lot of time at you know the original cloud Sherpas and, and rolling out um, you know really big application cloud application stacks um, for, you know, on top of old legacy frameworks. Something which I've reflected on is that um, we, there's been this emergency idea that almost the app is the center of the universe. Um, and what we found increasingly was that um, that that might have been a mistake because getting the apps to work together was was like constructing a whole bunch of pipes, but not putting any water through them. Um, what we're now seeing is this pivot uh, in focus where people are getting really serious about um, uh, the data. And, and what we're saying is that this kind of feels like a Copernican moment. It is kind of like thinking that the Earth was the center of the universe. Um, actually, people are beginning to realize that the data is. And uh, we're saying that instead of, instead of functionality being the, the center of the business system, it's actually it's the data itself, um, in particular, the customer data, because the customer data is flowing through the, the entire structure. So if we continue with kind of the cute, you know, Star Trek metaphor here, um, we, we talk about this idea called like the customer halo. Um, it's this idea of an accretion of data. And, and we, we talk this way because... We've worked with hundreds of companies, and it's different, as you'll see on the next slide. It's it's different from customer to customer, um, but they all what they all have in common is very few of them were literally built that way from scratch. Uh, they've evolved over time, and so you do have this uh, difference in in what that central concept of customer is. And I will say, importantly, plenty of people it isn't actually one location. Even people who say they've built a data lake doesn't necessarily mean that there's literally one central repository of all information. Some of these repositories are very dense, very tight. Some of them are spewing out information like a central control system to, to other parts of the puzzle. Some of them are big and bloated, um, but but they they all have certain key qualities in that they, they exert a level of gravity over the rest of the infrastructure, the rest of the particularly cloud application infrastructure sitting around them. So what we've been kind of leaning into is this idea of going, okay, it's similar to you know API style thinking, but we're trying to connect the dots between the API world of cloud applications and what is really a very legacy world uh, in, in data and intelligence and, and how we build uh, data stacks to feed intelligence. So we've been going, instead kind of imagine it you know, in an object oriented fashion. Think about it as applications sitting around the center um, and they're interacting with that central hub. They're, they're powered by uh, this idea of, of um, the customer center, the customer core. But, but this is what's really important. And on this slide, you can see it. Um, businesses continuously talk about creating a customer 360, right? And nobody finds it. <laughs> and, and we've become quite philosophical on this. We've gone, there's a reason for that. It is the data itself. Mm -hmm. It is not an integration. It is not an application. The, the concept of your customer is the lifeblood of the business. It is in motion. Um, and the bigger the businesses get, the more obvious this becomes. We have synchronizing issues between not just different applications, right? Sync issues between the CRM, logistics, back office, um, ERP, even synchronization across the planet. Like we're physically limited by the speed of light through glass. Um, so the idea that you're literally going to be able to say that there's 
there is guaranteed to be one central app and that's the customer. We kind of reject it. It, it, it's not true. But the thing which is really important um, and why we, we, we go on this journey of saying there needs to be some pretty quantum changes in how people have conceptualized um, the way of approaching data and analytics, it comes down to, we think probably this one big thing, the, the movement of data, which is what we're going to touch on a bit in this presentation. Even the concept of if you even have to move it has completely changed in the course of the last really three years. And in particular, it's gone to overdrive in the last 12 months. So we now have these ideas of, of replication. There's a kind of a gold rush on as people are exploring what data replication could actually mean. But we've gone even beyond replication. We've got these amazing ideas about data mesh. And we're not going to go into the extensive philosophical discussions about you know, what constitutes a data mesh. But um, certainly, I think us, uh, for me, I'm increasingly looking at even the concept of data lakes and going, guys, even that's legacy. Right, mm -hmm. that, that lakes were growing enormously back in 2012. We're, we're talking about something that's emerged that's even beyond that. If you're able to share data, like you do with something like the Snowflake Data Marketplace, and you can share an entire terabyte data warehouse instantaneously because it's already triple replicated across effectively a, a, a triple cloud mesh, um, that's a completely different mechanic. It's a completely different way of thinking about synchronization of certainly analytical based information. Um, between a functional application and whatever this other idea is of the, the state of the, the customer, the state of your relationship with the customer. So we use these analogies because part of our job, and I get that you know they're a, bit, they're a bit fanciful, but the reason we do it is part of our job is to try and have this conversation with customers that in, have just been bombarded with, with hashtag after hashtag after hashtag. Right? They've, they've no sooner been told that the future is all about big data, then they're told that the future is no SQL, then they're told that the, data, the future is lake, then they're told that now the future is actually no, it's mesh. Right? They, they can barely keep up. And, and we're, what we've been trying to do is to go, look, how do we start to create some ways of thinking about data that line up more to the, the object-oriented world of, of APIs and the cloud, but which are still going to recognize the fact that we're never going to be able to put a perfect envelope around the concept of data. It's always going to be something that is in motion, like the waters in the pipe. Um, and, and the physics of how we navigate that are changing because of some of these new technologies, because of what's capable, uh, it, it, what's possible in things like Snowflake. Um, so our, our stack, and this is by no means the only modern cloud data stack, right? There, there's lots of stuff happening in this space, but we, we only do this now. So I can talk to you about specifically the technologies that Lightfold focuses on. All right, Fivetran's a big one. We we love Fivetran. We get that there are lots of other things that can also do, you know, replication um, and have various solutions for for movement. But Fivetran captured our attention because the the mission of Fivetran wasn't to say let's build another bunch of connectors. The mission of Fivetran was to go. Your ultimate objective is to interpret that data analytically and to have it power things. So what you need is is reliable replication of the data state from any of those other bubbles we had in the other diagram, anywhere in your, in your system grouping of, of uh, applications, you need that as a service. That, could be that should be commoditized. And you shouldn't need to be responsible for making sure that it's, it's working successfully, that it has failover, um, and that the output needs to be li literally analytic ready day one. You need to immediately be able to query it and get insights. Now, when you combine that then with the idea of you know, what we're replicating it to, is then something like Snowflake, where, um, frankly, you know, fell in love the first moment I was able to write one query in Snowflake and, and I could join semi-structured JSON data directly to massively structured data, you know, in the terabyte range and run queries instantly and have them return stuff on unindexed data in, you know, in half a second. Um, the level of compute capability in, in things like Snowflake is on a whole different level. Um, but we need to have an effective way to get the data to that point. So you can see our analogy here, we continue to run with kind of the space thing. We're going, um, you're thinking about the physics now in terms of um, like the current space race, it's about how we get data to the place where um, zero G is now in effect. H how do we get it to the platform where we then know we can now move it, shape it, structure it, transform it at ways that just could not be done terrestrially, right? Um, the, if we take the on-prem example, be being, we all should know by now the, the value in going to cloud in being able to immediately scale our compute and our, and our storage. But I, I really don't think people have appreciated what it means when, when you can just do that in the background without having to do heavy engineering 
um, and all you're doing is writing SQL. Mm -hmm. that, that's actually a, a massive uh, uptick in, in uh, the broad scale cap people, the capability of people in the analytics space. So it all becomes about what's the most fast, effective way to, to get the data to shared with, replicated into a platform, a, a modern cloud data platform like Snowflake. And from there, we can use things like DBT, another thing we love, um, to very, very rapidly generate um, insights through to whatever your poison is of visibility, but also obviously increasingly to predictive models and deploying things like predictive AI. Um, and it, we've actually got to the point, right, like we're, uh, I think and the other speakers were mentioning it today around, uh, is it ETL or is it ELT? I'm actually trying to go one further. I've been increasingly going, you just call it IO for God's sakes. Like the, the key point is to say that transformation is now something which should only be occurring in the area that is the most powerful and the best commodity price point for that transformation to occur. And that SQL is the transformation mechanism or, or you know, obviously not just SQL, whatever your query language is, if you're working with a no SQL framework, but that um, instead of having transformation scattered through the whole damn stack and buried in lots of different brittle pipelines at the back end, centralize the transformation. That doesn't necessarily mean centralize the data, right? That's, that's the key. I, th I think we got a bit deceived by assuming we have to have a central hub of data. It's nice if you have it, but I know a hell of a lot more people who don't have it and are going to struggle to ever get it than I know people who have fully achieved it. But centralizing the transformation makes a hell of a lot of sense because the transformation is where we're burning the energy and the effort. And doing that in a highly scalable platform in a central location and with repeatability in terms of our DevOps flows and our data ops flows is, is just a sensible way to scale. So that's a little bit about you know kind of how we operate um, with the technologies that we roll um, with. But obviously, it also requires us to kind of do things a bit differently as well. I'm going to throw to G, um, who can walk you through a little bit about how Lightfall does that. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Um, and just to, just to echo what you're saying, yeah, I've been having so many conversations lately with our, with our customers and our prospects and people in the ecosystem that they're finding they're able to move so quickly with the modern tools, with things like Snowflake and Fivetran. They're able to get to outcomes incredibly quickly. But then, uh, like that famous phrase from uh, from Jurassic Park, they, they got there, they built it, they did it, and then uh, bam, uh, what, what do we do now? Um, so that's something that I find uh, pretty exciting is being able to talk to people about how, okay, now that you've got all this phenomenal power, what can we do with it? Um, that's really Lightfold's reason for being. So obviously we, we don't want to spend too much time talking about us, but I just want to give you a bit of context for why we have these beliefs and why we are thinking this way. Um, and that then will lead hopefully into some more discussion about, well, how does it fit with the future? So um, as introduced by Chris earlier, thank you so much, Chris. We're, we're a cloud analytics specialist uh, consultancy um, our founding team of five have been working on uh, data and data analytics for better part of uh, two decades. So we've, we've got some chops, we've got some history, but what we're most excited about and what we've been excited about since the beginning is being able to do things a little bit differently. Um, traditional consulting is pretty broken. Uh, data, anal data and analytics consultancy is especially broken because it's non-deterministic. You go into wanting to solve a problem for insights. This is going beyond just you know building a new report. You're wanting to solve for insights. You're wanting to solve for AI. You're wanting to solve for, for something you don't necessarily even know when you start, but you know where you're going. And that's why everything we do is fixed price because we, we, we eat that risk. We're confident in our abilities to get to that point. And so we say, no, no, fixed price will get you to the outcome. And that matches up very well when you're talking about how powerful and how fast the current stack is because we really can say getting the data to where it needs to be, trivial. Structuring the data in a good way, we, that's figured out. We know how to do that well. So let's go straight to how do we get the insights on it? And that's really, that's really what we care about is actually going all the way from end to end. One of the other big things that we love to do is even on our smallest engagements, which are around about 15 grand, where we're rocking up saying, yep, you need some data move from here to here. You need it, you need it all singing, all dancing, but you can only give us 15 grand to make it work. That's fine. We still onboard an entire team of people. We bring executive oversight. We bring a producer to come in and make sure everything's running smoothly. We bring in technical specialists, design specialists, uh, all wrapped around a lead engineer who's bringing, who's who's moving through the entire process. 
The last thing I want to talk about, just again, to give you that context of why we've arrived at this thinking and, and why we want to keep pushing the envelope into the new frontier of this kind of thinking, is it'd be kind of silly for us to say, we think that all this is possible at speed, and we think that there's a whole new way of working with data, this kind of orbital thinking, even one step beyond cloud, if we didn't have some, some really kind of fundamental chops in the background for how we make that real. So we have a design methodology called Tesseract. Now, over the last kind of five years, the word Tesseract has become uh, meaning something a little bit different in the zeitgeist, thanks to Marvel. And we're happy to we're happy to claim that. That's fine. Tesseract is a cool word. But we thought of it coming from the Greek, Tesseras and Actis, the four rays. So when we're really thinking about, OK, what do we fundamentally do when we provide value to a customer? We're taking data from all of these different spaces and we're turning it all all the way through the machinations of, of all of the in, inbuilt steps into one person sitting at a desk, looking at information and clicking on the next thing they need to do. That's, that's really the transformation. So that's where we bake in Tesseract into everything we're doing. It's human-centered design thinking, but it's human-centered design thinking that has been tweaked and massaged and molded such that it is focused around data applications. And we do that through a bunch of different ways. It's, it's, it's very well structured. It's very well laid out. It's, uh, it's designed to get to an outcome quickly. So we actually look at component by component of the entire end user journey and map it up with the business's drivers and the, the business's requirements. So we don't throw the requirements of the business out with the bathwater. We want to make sure that we're joining it together, but we're focused always on that end user experience. I like to think of it as this massive, massive pyramid starting at the vast cloud of data, the vast solar system of data, and then going all the way down to a point, which is literally the user sitting at a screen thinking, what do I need to do next to maximize whatever it is I want to do that day? Um, and that's really what, what Lightfold is all about. So yeah, thanks thanks for letting me tell, tell, tell you a little bit about us. Uh, now back to some tech with a bit of more context. Is, is this where we offer steak knives? Do we offer steak that's knives? It, that's, that's it, that's <laughs> it. Um, so it, but in all seriousness, uh, it, is, it is actually very important. Um, we, do, we do genuinely believe that in order to do the stuff we're talking about, um, we need different architectures that are going to help us achieve it. Um, so we wanted to, and I've seen Chris appear. Chris, are you telling me that I'm at time? Oh, uh, no, no, you... Uh, no, okay, good. I think we've got a bit of time. That's okay. Still have a little... Yeah, good. So no, that's all right. Um, so uh, we wanted to just give a little bit more detail about what do we talk about when we say, um, you know, orbital architecture. Um, this is, we're seeing a bunch of themes emerge naturally from kind of the, the, the modern data stack group and, and this new amazing phrase I love, you know, analytics engineers, which has really gone kind of gangbusters uh, in, in the zeitgeist and on, on Twitter in the last um, two or three months. So uh, we're trying to kind of put some words around the protocols. And again, I think these words will be very, very familiar to anybody in the API and application space because modularity and, and things being rugged, having sufficient failover, um, th these are the fundamentals of DevOps, but believe it or not, they're almost non-existent in my experience in, in data operations outside of places where that is essential to the operations of the DevOps. So if you're, if you're working at a, um, a Netflix or, or at a Facebook, then, then the two are, are deeply interlinked. But for an awful lot of other people um, who are just trying to run analytics for their core business, which might not have anything to do with tech, um, analytics hasn't looked like that. So um, it's about us having a conversation about, you know, just like in, in space, how do, you, how do you compartmentalize the different pieces to make sure they are rugged and don't fail? Um, and this is where Vivetran for us has been huge, is, is it's not just another suite of connectors. It, it's going, um, how, do, how do they do exactly those three different bits? Um, for the purposes of effectively the IO step. Um, and I'm just like NASA putting out a, you know, a contract to say, I just need people to help me get stuff to the International Space Station, right? That, that concept that we're going to commoditize the mobility, I, I think is dead, dead on because I'm sick. For, I make money from charging people to, to build data pipelines. I think it's a waste of their money. I, th I think it costs a hell of a lot um, and can become incredibly brittle. The transform being pushed instead into the platform makes more sense where we can govern it with things like DBT um, and where we can then look at it as a whole rather than having it trapped inside individual uh, pipes where a failure in the logic or a change in the schema can actually result in the inability for the data to even complete the move, which can then lead to much bigger problems 
downstream in terms of data consumption. So the idea of, uh, of someone saying what we're really doing here is as a service, we're, we're warranting that that connector is really going to work and work to a, a, a different standard than just, oh, yeah, the last six times someone tried it, it was fine. But you've got teams constantly monitoring those connectors, um, keeping them in line with any changes to the source um, documentation from whatever that source application is, and then ensuring that the output that arrives is query ready schema. Um, that, that's actually a really big deal. <laughs> that, that is something which would normally be tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars of consulting and, and staffing that is, is just done for you. And, and that increasingly I look at it and go, that's probably one of the first most important steps in, in what the modern stack is promising is can we get back to focusing on analytics? Which then brings me to my second bugbear. Um, and this is, this is where, you know, this is the hill I'm going to die on. The, there is a problem with the DevOps world, right? The problem with the DevOps world is that data is one of the last things you care about. Um, the whole idea is to move at a very high level of development speed. And data usually hits the system only in the final UAT processes. And that, that's actually an issue. <laughs> that's an issue when you are then also in the data world, if we're building systems that a bank then requires to be able to be you know, completely reconciled across the entire system. Um, if, we're, if we're treating data as effectively a UAT step, um, that's, that's insufficient. Uh, and the mechanism by which we traditionally, you know, I'm talking like 30 years ago, guaranteed those type of things in a database was schema. And we've had this big bit for the last you know, five years where we all went on a tear and we're convinced that the best thing in the world was to create a no SQL data lake and that'll solve everything. And I just don't believe it does because if you take structured data and you destructure it, you tear it into its constituent atoms, you're actually destroying information. The relationship between elements is a functional part of information. So I, I think there's been a trend towards becoming quite lax in our analytical rigor. Um, and, and the focus, if we're, again, where we have um, businesses where the focus is just produce visibility into what my platform is doing, I understand how we get there. Right? because you're moving at a development speed where, worst case scenario, you rebuild your pipe. But that's literally not what we can put into a bank who's asking you to build this type of system to be their back-end data warehouse, but to do it in the cloud and to do it with an API mindset. So that there's a bit here, um, and we've been really you know, enjoying the, the world of things like Data Vault. Um, we think Data Vault's undergoing a massive renaissance at the moment because um, things that actually are hyper-structured, they actually go the other way. They're very, very well structured. Um, and that structure is logical. That structure isn't onerous. If, if you can run it on a platform with enough grunt that doesn't cost a fortune. Uh, a lot of the reason why some of the structured components of the data world were thrown out was actually architectural. It was actually to do with the, the hardware it was running on. It was the cost of running certain types of very expensive hardware in order to power performant queries. One of the big implications of us suddenly having phenomenal cosmic power at our fingertips is that um, we need to re-examine some of the things we've thrown out because maths is maths. <laughs> and if you have to solve reconciliation of data in a set, you're going to fall back on the same maths that our, our granddads and grandmoms used to put people on the moon. The maths hasn't changed. A and we think that there, there is increasingly this examination of how we're managing schema. One of the really cool things DBT does is that it, it invites you to consider the, your process of transformation as a series of stepwise models effectively propagated by SQL. Um, and, and again, we see this plugging into this, this simplified modern stack as you're going, get the data in its raw state rocked up, then use an Inmon style warehousing framework to, to get that you know, structured and, and, and shape. <laughs> um, I just saw the comment from Nigel. <laughs> not loving the click happy interface, I, I feel you. Um, and I'm not, I should just clarify my comment there as well, just to jump on that one. I, I, I understand their necessity. Please don't think, I'm being a bit tongue in cheek. I hope you all know that. Of course, pipelines are still a thing we have to build, but, but it's me going, I, I think there's definitely a trend emerging that the less you do of that, the better it's going to, to ultimately be. And the more you can put what the pipeline transformations are doing into a central transform the better. Um, but yeah, we, we are building this. I did want to make a shout out to, to Data Vault, um, is that this world where um, highly structured data, the type of thing that, again, big bank implementations did 10 years ago, um, is having a renaissance because this is incredibly powerful. This is the total opposite of no SQL. This is a hyper-normalized schema, not a hyper-denormalized schema. This is schema in the fifth and sixth sometimes normal form. Th these are schemas that can handle like tri-temporal structures. These are really 
quite detailed structures. These structures can do things like effectively, you know, a built-in MDM and data quality management. And these are very doable in a very short space of time in a very agile way once you've got them in orbit. That's the key. B building these on your racked tin 10 years ago, 15 years ago, very hard, a lot of money. But once you've got it in orbit and you've got something like an MPP platform like Snowflake, these are incredible. And the crazy bit, guys, is it's actually what the AI wants. When you go to build the AI, the AI doesn't care about your business process. It cares about your ontology. It cares about things that are real. And, and ontology is a whole area of the analytical profession that has, I, I think, died and is having a resurrection. People are going, you know what? You have to actually talk about what's real. It matters that somewhere in your data structure, there is a thing and that is only customers. And it does not matter what the source system was that fed it. That is our definition of customer. And that is our definition of product. And that is our definition of loan. And, and this is, you know, obviously some of the MDM world, but, but it's about going, if we're getting serious about true analytics, some of these ideas that have fallen by the wayside for whatever reason, I, I, we are absolutely seeing them coming screaming to the fore um, is as, as the, the power becomes so universal and so commoditized. If you are performing analytics at scale for an organization, you can't rest on your technical chops alone. You just can't because it's becoming too easy to do incredible things. You, you've got to return to some focus on your, your analytical capabilities and your ability to bring structure to things to provide insight. Um, end soapbox rant. Uh, I think that's all of our slides. So we'll, and we're pretty much on time. Um, if we want to uh, go to Q&A or, or have any questions, if anybody wants to take it up with me for my inflammatory statements, go. For it. <laughs> uh, awesome. Thank you. And uh, yeah, apologies. I, I, I guess I got over eager. I popped in halfway through your chat there. <laughs> <That's> uh, <okay. laughs> I was looking at my time and thinking that went fast. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> I was like, yeah. No, I wasn't that out of line. Perfect timing. Um, yeah, it looks like we got time for uh, at least a couple of questions. Um, so I'll start off with, um, what are your clients finding to be the greatest advantage that they'll um, that they'll realize when they move to this more modern data stack compared to what could be considered like a legacy approach? Well, I, I can tell you again, it was kind of a theme uh, of the of the presentation. Um, Five trends crazy. Um, wherever we're turning this on, and you know, I can't mention the specific customers, but you know, we've got some work at the moment where I'm going, I did projects like this, and it took three years to get to this point, and we've we've done it in like two months and and done it properly. Five trans ability to um, to literally manage the complete connection piece as a service and really do that, like really let me just go to sleep and know. Absolutely. It's going to rock up and it's ready to query. It is a tremendous benefit to a customer. And one big thing actually came up in some conversations this week, um, which is going to be a massive game changer for the for the for the customer, is um, the automated schema change management. That the idea that because right right now what they've got going on is they've got a whole bunch of information streaming in from sources that they don't control and that the schema could change and they don't have any any say so whether it does or doesn't. Hopefully they're getting notified, but sometimes they don't. And then that means that everything down flowing from that has a chance of breaking straight away just because like a column yeah. title changes or something. The automated schema change management gives you just well, it'll be a game changer for them. So yeah, I'll leave it at that. But it's pretty cool. No, absolutely. And it comes back to that idea again of the ruggedness, right? Which again is so important in API land is that mm -hmm. I, I don't think this is, please don't think that this is me going, you know, the, the whole world of object oriented API building cloud applications has, has got it wrong. Not at all. It's, it's got it very right. But but the data world is is actually, it feels a lot like it felt to be doing initial cloud implementations 10 years ago. It, it really hasn't progressed. We talk about CDC, we talk about change data capture. Like it's like it's revolutionary. Change data capture is like it's twenty years old, but it, it's still probably the coolest thing I've got to do data replication and and some of the stuff that you know we know Five Trends innovating on. You know, it, there's so much stuff that's about to happen in data um, that that is I think going to to propel it into spaces um, exactly like we saw happen with the API and the cloud revolution in applications over the last ten years. And Brett, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm glad you got a chance to talk to Dan himself. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that there'll there'll be lots of people revisiting that those type of decisions as things become easier um, to to use. Do we have time for more questions, Chris? 
Um, it looks like, uh, uh, it looks, unfortunately, uh, I'm afraid we're due for a break at, uh, at two twenty. So, uh, but w will you guys be available in the, in the chat? If you yeah, we'll be in the chat so we can, we can hit you up Nigel as well. Okay. Um, thank you very much. That was, yeah, uh, interesting. And I'll, I'll keep my eye on that. Uh, anytime I'm doing a data pipeline now, I'll be, uh, screaming inside. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no. I was thinking there's a better way. Uh, yeah. better that was cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, folks.